But I want to share with you out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, when you have it, say amen. amen. This, is, this is Moses. And it reads like this. It says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised an oath to your ancestors. Somebody say live, say increase. Now in verse 2 it says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Look at here, to humble and test you in order to know that was in your to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. Look at this, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. How many of you come to church knowing that it's God speaking on Sunday morning? All right. It goes on to say, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years, knowing then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God also disciplines you. How many know discipline brings strength? Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God, look at this, this is the best part, is bringing you into a good land. A good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out of the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vine and fig tree, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. How many know that's good news? A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Look at this. And when you have eaten and are satisfied, the Bible gives us a command. That when you have eaten and you are satisfied and God has done all the things he said he was going to do, look what he says. He says, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Come on. Just shout to him and just say, thank you, Jesus. Say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated this morning. How many know God is good? God will fulfill his promises in our life. You know, I want to share with you something that God has been reminding me of when we first came to San Diego in 2003, I believe, is that whenever God wants to grow us and de desires to grow us, he always takes us on a journey. Many of you remember in those early days when we came from Los Angeles, how Pastor Sonny talked about us going on a journey, going on a journey. Well, when you read Deuteronomy chapter 8, you, you see Moses reminding God's people that they were on a journey. Look at your neighbor. Tell them we're on a journey for God. I, I've discovered that when people decide to go to church, they're not just looking for a place. But I believe that when people really want to go to church and really want to make a commitment for God, they're looking for people. I think there's a difference. I think if you're new today and you're here just to check out the church and check out the, the children's department and check out whether there's air conditioning or not or check the comforts of the chairs, can I hear an amen? I'll tell you, you're coming with the wrong mentality because there's, there might even be some places out there that have a better setting than we do. But when I joined up with Victor Outreach, I didn't join up with a place, I joined up with a people of power. I joined up with a people of destiny. I joined up with a people who had a promise from God. That's what Moses was sharing with the children of Israel. He's saying, I've given you, a, God has given you a promise and God has been faithful to his promise. I was looking for a people of power. I was looking for people who were going somewhere with a destination in mind. And I want to tell you, at that phase of my life, that's what I needed. I think every leader needs to hear this because we're working with people. And, and, and if you want to be effective with people, you got to know what they need. You got to know what they need. At that phase of my life, that's what I needed. I didn't need a church. I needed a people. I didn't need to go to a place. I needed to partner with a group of people that had a vision and a plan of God within their life. And I want to tell you that today I am not the man that I once was. I'm not the man I once was. You're not the person you once were. 
You're not the woman you once were. You know, I want to tell you this. I'm not even the pastor I once was. The man I was when I walked into this place in 2003, I am not that man anymore. I've been on a journey with God. I've been walking with the Lord. I've been walking with a promise. I've been walking with a vision. I've been walking under the hand of God in my life. How about you? And when you walk under the hand of God, let me tell you, you, you can't walk the same. You can't be the same. People who are walking on their own, they're, they're going to stay the same. But how many know when you're walking under the hand and guidance of the Lord, you're bound to change. You're bound to get better. You're bound to grow. Come on, somebody. When you're walking under the hand of God, you walk a little taller than you once did. You walk a lot stronger than, than you once did. How many know God has the power to change you? You walk a lot wiser than, than you once did. And so to be a part of a church, how many say this is my church? It's to be a part of a people that are on a journey moving under the hand and the guidance of the Lord. But let me share this with you to experience the promise that God has has for you. And and this was certainly true in my life is if I wanted to experience the fullness of God's plan, I needed to allow God to do a work in me. And I think that's the that's the, the reason why some people succeed in the kingdom of God and some people fail in the kingdom of God, because the people who fail in the kingdom of God, they just come to church. But the people that come to church knowing that there's a plan and knowing that the hand of God is able to move. These are people that allow the hand of God to do a work inside of them. And I think that's something you need to be acquainted with is that we don't just come to church to perform. We come to church for God to perform on us. Come on, somebody. He's doing a work in our life. See, why does God do a work? Because deliverance is not your final destination. Let me talk to the brothers in the home, the sisters in the home, the people that are coming in just to get out of trouble. Let me tell you, deliverance is not your final destination. You know what God's plan to do in your life is not just to deliver you. God's plan is to develop you. God's plan is to make you into everything that he has called you to be. He wants to improve that life. He wants to improve that marriage. He wants to take that family and take that calling to a whole nother level. Are you with me this morning? See, let me tell you this. If deliverance is not God's final destination, then understand that you're not going to die in the wilderness. That's what Moses was telling the children of Israel. He says, you went through the wilderness, but God kept you in the midst of the wilderness. God kept you. He fed you in the wilderness. He took care of your clothes in the wilderness. When you were tired, he gave you strength to keep on walking. Somebody help me preach this morning. He gave you strength to keep on walking. Let me tell you, you're not going to die in the wilderness. I know sometimes you feel like you're going to die. Sometimes you feel like you're not going to make it. Sometimes you feel like you're not going to get through. But God doesn't let you die in the wilderness because there's a promise to be fulfilled there's a plan to be fulfilled there's a people that God is raising up those are the people of victory outreach San Diego and if you are a part of the church I came to tell you you're not going to die in the wilderness you're going all the way into the promised land there is a good territory for you there is a place flowing with milk and honey come on somebody don't give up don't throw in the towel God is just getting started on you come on and give him a praise right now don't lose heart He's going to bring you through. He's going to bring your marriage through. He's going to bring your children through. Come on, somebody. The children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. But the wilderness was necessary. And this is where some of us need to accept the fact that the wilderness is necessary. The wilderness is necessary. The Bible tells us very clearly is that there was a purpose for the wilderness. Because the wilderness is where God tested the condition of their heart. He took them from Egypt. He allowed them to go in the wilderness to test what was in their heart so that he could prepare them for the inheritance that he had for them. And let me tell you that when God chooses a person, he does so that that person may experience two powerful things within their life. Are you with me? Write this down. Number one, he chooses a person that they may know the power of walking with God as his chosen servant. He chooses a person that every person in this place will understand what it means to walk with God. How many of you are walking with God? 
Wow, I'm not that encouraged. I hope you come to church, man, with the attitude to receive and not just wait for the next thing to happen, man. Are you guys, are you guys all right or what? Okay, wake up a little bit then, man. Because I end it, I can end it right now. All right. How many are walking with God? Thank you. See, he chooses us so that we can walk with him as his chosen servant. John chapter 15, verse 16 says, you did not choose me, I chose you. So many people come to church and say, I choose to serve God. No, you don't. God chose you to serve him. Because he could have let you die in the wilderness. He could have let you die in the crack house. He could have let you die in the will, with the needle in your arm. He could have let you die in that relationship. He could have let you die in that situation. But God says, I didn't let you die. I, cho- I chose you. You didn't choose me, buddy. I chose you. I pulled you out of it. Come on, somebody. I pulled you out of the fire. I pulled you out of the storm. I pulled you out of the situation. I chose you. You didn't choose me. How arrogant of you. I chose you. And not only did he choose us, but the Bible says in John 15, he chose us that we might go and bear fruit. He chose us that we might go and bear fruit. He chose us that we might go and be spiritual. He chose us that we might go and walk as a representative of him. He chose us that we might go and not walk in the flesh. He chose us that we might go and not walk in our own agenda. He chose us that we would go and not walk like the world. He chose us that we might go and bear much fruit and have good success and be an ambassador of his kingdom. Somebody say amen. Amen. He chose us with an assignment in in his mind. He chose us with. See, that's the question. What is your assignment? Now, some of you, for the first time, you're realizing that, whoa, I didn't choose God. God chose me. Great. Okay, let that sink in. (laughs) But for some of you that have known that God has chosen you, what is your assignment? And here's my question. Are you being faithful to your assignment? When I got saved, I knew God's assignment on my life. And to this day, I continue to walk under assignment from God. What was the assignment? The assignment in my life, because I was the first one ever saved in my family, was to break every generational curse that plagued my family for four generations. He called me to break the curse of alcoholism. He called me to break the curse of drug addiction. He called me to break the curse of divorce. I'll tell you, it hasn't been easy, my friend, but I'm still breaking the curse because I understand that I didn't choose God. It was God that chose me. He says, and I've chosen you that you might go and bear much. Are you being faithful to the assignment that God has given? Oh, my God, I'm preaching better. You're saying amen. Are you being faithful to the assignment? Or are you just coming to church? Coming to church to sing a few songs. Coming to church to give a little tip to God. Coming to church to warm the pew. Coming to church to check things out. Are you coming to church understanding that he has given you an assignment? He has placed a purpose and a calling in your life. Somebody needs to say, God, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Come on. He chose us. He's given us an assignment. And then the second thing, and the second reason he chooses, because he chooses us that we may experience the joy, not only as walking as a chosen child of God, but watch this, experience the joy. Somebody say joy. Joy. Of walking with others who are chosen. Why do we come to church on Sunday? We come to church to gather with the chosen. (laughs) Look at your neighbor and say, you are chosen. Say, I'm glad I'm sitting next to you. Because when I'm not in church, I'm walking with a bunch of jokers. I'm walking with a bunch of sinners. I'm walking with a bunch of people who are not right in their mind. Thank God that I'm in church this morning because God has chosen me to walk with the chosen. He's called me and chosen me to walk in his body. He's chosen me to walk with a group of people that are not just a church with a sign on a building. He's called me to walk with a group of people that have power. He's called me to walk with a group of people that have an an anointing from God, a purpose in their life. Somebody thank God that you are walking with the chosen people of God. Don't underestimate the power of this group. Yes, sir. 
Don't underestimate us. Don't underestimate what we are able to do when we understand that we have been chosen by the living God. Do not underestimate the leadership in this church. Do not underestimate the men and women who know how to pray, who know how to warfare, who know how to move as children of the living God. Don't underestimate us. We may not look like much, but we got something the world does not have. We have the power of the Holy Ghost. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't, don't mess with us. Don't mess with God's people. Don't mess with the children of God. Don't let us get together in a prayer meeting because we know how to move mountains. We know how to put serpents and devils under our feet. We know how to heal the sick. We know how to deliver. We are the chosen people of the living God. I don't, oh, you need to get excited. You need to understand who God has called you to be. See, if God wanted to raise up a military force, he could have. But God never intended Israel to be militant in the natural. He wanted to raise up a people who are militant in the spirit. And if you are chosen, then you understand you walk with a group of people that the Bible calls peculiar. Young people, hear me. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Stop trying to be like the world. Okay, there ain't no power out there. Be the child of God that he's called you to be and walk with his people who are peculiar. We're peculiar. Come on, somebody. That means we don't fit. We don't fit with everybody else. We don't think like everybody else. We don't talk like everybody else. We don't go put on social media and act and conduct ourselves like everybody else. We are a peculiar people. We have a power that the world does not possess. He raised up a people. Watch. He raised up a people who were peculiar. He raised up a people who were spiritual. Not a natural army, but a spiritual army. Someone say spiritual army. That's why when they gathered around Jericho, they, they had all these people. They could have easily conquered the city, but instead of drawing bows and swords, he, he commanded them to shout. To shout. Because he wanted to know that they were a people, not of natural power, but a people of spiritual power. He wanted them to know that they were a separated people, his own special people that would bring forth the praises of him who he called out of darkness and brought into his marvelous light. Who reads the Bible this morning? See, the peculiar people of God are a prayer people who move mountains. And what God taught his people and God wants to teach you and I as his peculiar people is this, is that is that God taught his people that you don't take territory until you take airspace. In a war, you've got to control the airspace. You've got to control what's happening in the air before you try to push forward and land. And that's a word for somebody. Don't try to take territory until you've prayed. Don't try to take territory until you spend time with God. Don't you understand there's a power that God wants to use you to move in the heavenlies before it happens in the natural. We are a peculiar people. Come on, say amen. amen. So God chooses us to be chosen. He chooses us to walk with a group of people that are chosen. But then in Deuteronomy, he reminds his people that he allowed them to wander. He allowed them to wander. A journey that should have just been a couple weeks turned into 40 years not because they were lost in the natural, it's because they were lost in the spiritual. Not because they didn't know their way on the outward, it's that they could not find their way inwardly. He said, I allowed you to wander in the wilderness. I allowed you to wander in that season because I needed to remove things from your heart. I needed to remove things from your heart. Some of you are praying, say, God changed my season. God says, no, change your heart. God changed my situation. No, 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 change your heart. I'm allowing you to wander because you got some stuff inside of you that you can't take into the promise. You got some people in your life that you're not willing to cut loose. And until you cut them loose, you ain't going in. And until we let God deal with our heart, we'll never enter into the promised land. And we have to accept that this morning. You, you, can, you, can, you can fake it. You can, you can do all that and go through all the spiritual motions. But if you're not letting God work on you, 
You got to let God work on you. In the wilderness, he, he, he said he allowed you to go in there in the wilderness because it was a season of preparation. It was a season of preparedness. It was a season where God was getting ready, the people ready to go in and take possession of what he had for their life. And I want to talk to some of you that you're working with people, you're discipling people. I've learned this is that sometimes you've got to allow people to wander until they're ready to submit to God. You, you got to let them wander. You, you got to let that disciple, that rebellious disciple say, you know what? I'm going to let you wander. I'm going to let you wander and wonder until you realize that the only way you're going to break through is when you submit to God as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Until you recognize that we are in a serious battle, we're in a serious war, and God has a plan for your life, and you did not choose God. God chose you. Come on, somebody. And sometimes God will let us wander in order to prepare us. Can I hear an amen? amen. I believe there's four seasons every journey, journeyer, or really the word is sojourner. Uh, every, every sojourner will experience on their journey. And, and, when, and a, a person who journeys or a sojourner is really a picture of the church. When you think of someone on a journey, it's a, it's a photograph, it's an image, it's a picture of the church. And, and I won't have time to get through all of them, but I want to just share a few things. I think it's going to speak to you this morning. Number one, it's the seed season. The second season is the stretching season. The third season is the settling season. And then the fourth season is the succession season. The seed season, the stretching season, the settling season, and the succession season. Every single one of us is in a particular season. Every single one of us is in a particular season. It's important that if you're going to fully possess the promise, you understand what season you're in. Let's take a moment. Let's talk about the seed season. Everybody say seed season. The seed season represents new life. New life. I want you to know every life is a seed. Every life is a seed. Every person that is here this morning, you have a life. Your life is a seed. And I want you to know that your life was purchased by the blood of Jesus. So the fact that our life became a seed came by way of Calvary. And understanding that is understanding that God desires to plant us and he desires to water us. He bought our life. Then he takes our life and he begins to plant our life. Then he begins to water our life. Now, for a seed to grow and for a seed to fulfill its destiny, how many know that seed must be buried? That seed must come under some dirt. Come on. It, it, it's, it's not a clean process. <laughs> if, if you want to be everything God's called you to be, understand it's not a clean process. Tell your neighbor, it's not a clean process. It, 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 let me tell you, success is messy. It's a messy process. Young people, understand me. It's a messy process. You want it to be clean, you won't grow. You, you, God's going to mess you up. God's going to allow some people to come into your life and mess you up. They'll mess up your hair and mess up your clothes and mess up all that little clean, perfect image you're trying to put together. Because if you want to grow, you got to come under some dirt. you got to submit to the soil. That's why I submitted my life in Victor Outreach, because I said, there's good soil at Victor Outreach. I said, I said, if God could take a drug addict and turn him into a man of God, what in the world could God do with me? I submitted my life to some good soil. And, and the seed season is when you begin to place yourself in a dirty place, a cold place, and sometimes a lonely place. Sometimes for God to grow you, you've got to get alone. You've got to get away from the people that want to take you away from God's plan. You've got to get alone with God. If your life wants to grow and you want your seed to grow, you've got to submit to the process of God. I could remember this season in my life very clearly. When I first got saved, I had to learn to walk alone. I had to learn to walk alone. So many people down there, they don't want to be alone. They're, they're so afraid to be alone, to walk alone. They're so worried about what other people think of them and say about them. They're so image conscious. But when I first got saved and I recognized that God had chosen me, I had to learn how to walk alone. I had to learn to walk alone. 
Hey, if you didn't like me, that wasn't my problem. That was your problem. Can I hear an amen? I had to walk alone. I had to go to restaurants and eat alone. I had to pray alone. I had to study my word alone. I had to go to the movies alone. You ain't saying nothing to me. I had to be comfortable with being alone. And that's why today, after 25 year, years of ministry, I'm still comfortable with being alone. You may not like me. Walk away. Don't matter. Ain't nothing new. I've been walking alone with God my entire life. I'm on a journey. I'm not here to please you. I'm here to please God. You, you got to learn how to walk alone. Come on. I had to learn to walk alone. And, and I had to bury myself in the soil of the promises of God. Because when you walk alone, people may not have a good word for you. But how many know God's word is the only word you need? People may not have a good word for you. People might even come against you. But God's word is the only word you need. I had to open up this word. I had to get in this Bible. I had to memorize the scriptures. I had to read the, the law. I had to read the poetic scriptures. I had to read the history. I had to read the New Testament. I had to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in the word of God. Come on. Not in Facebook, not in Instagram, not in clever quotes and slick marketing. I had to put my nose in the Bible. Come on, somebody. And to this day, if you go to my office, I framed it. I still have my first Bible because it was important to me when I was a seed buried in a bunch of dirt walking all by myself. I had no friends. I had no family serving God. I had no one to encourage me, but I had God who had chosen me out of darkness to walk with him. Oh, come on. Who has the same testimony this morning? I let God water me. Someone say, let God water you. My life was like a bamboo seed. Bamboo is a unique and powerful plant that becomes very useful in Asian culture. And the growth cycle of this plant is very interesting because when you plant a bamboo seed, it takes a long time to see any results. It is said that the seed of a bamboo will stay under the dirt for up to five years. And for five years, the owner of that bamboo seed has to water it and 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 water it. And what a water bill. And water it. <laughs> And go to the well and draw and water it and water it and water it and water it and water it. And then in the fifth year, it finally sprouts. That's how we feel with some of you. When are you going to sprout? <laughs> but there's something amazing happens. Something amazing happens is that once that seed sprouts, and how many know those disciples are eventually going to sprout? So don't stop watering. Don't stop preaching. Don't stop praying. Don't stop encouraging. Don't stop following up. Keep on watering. Say amen. amen. Once that seed sprouts, something powerful happens that in just a matter of 10 months, that bamboo can grow to 90 feet high. Took five years for it to sprout, but in less than one year, it shoots to be one of the highest trees in the forest. Go ahead and give God a praise. The second season is the stretching season. This is where the time, the time where God teaches us to trust Him for His future. We sprouted. Now we're trusting God. We're on a journey. This is where God teaches us to walk by faith and not by feeling. You might be there right now. This is the time where you've sprouted and now you feel the elements. You feel the wind. You feel the rain. You feel the opposition within your life. Come on, say amen. amen. You liked it being alone, but now you've got to face some stuff. Now you've got to allow the elements. But understand that when you're in a stretching season, God is growing your faith. God is building your character. It's a time where a person learns to maneuver in the environment God has placed them in. Understand that when you come to church, you come in as a seed, you sprout, and then you learn to move in the environment here. 
You learn to move in the culture that God has placed you in. It's in that season where you learn to pray. It's in that season where you learn to trust God. It's in that season where you learn how to have relationships with other people. See, I want to tell you that when you come to church, you need to build relationships. You need to be connected to your to your spiritual family. You need to learn to walk with other people who are chosen. Don't fight with them. Walk with them. Don't compare yourself with them. Walk with them. Don't be offended by them. If they have a better gift than you, walk with them. Come on, somebody. When you learn to celebrate someone else, guess what? God will raise up someone to celebrate you. There's no need to walk jealous and walk in competition. Let God stretch you. Let God build you. Let God make you. Come on, somebody. He's building your character. The third season is the settling season. The settling season. I want to tell you that every great house must eventually settle. Every great house. We're talking about the journey. You still with me? And every great, great house must eventually settle. I remember I bought a house here in San Diego a number of years ago that no one had lived in. No one had ever lived in that house. It was brand new. In fact, it was the house where they were selling the other houses from. The real estate agent was in that house selling the other houses in the, in the community using that house as the office. And we bought that house. Paid a lot of money for it. Big house. And I remember moving in and, and then telling me, listen, if you start seeing cracks in the house, don't be alarmed. I said, what do you mean don't be alarmed? I just spent a lot of money on this house. Come on, somebody. And, and this house is brand new. I don't want to see cracks. I just got in. I, you know, I just put my life savings on this house, all my hard work. I, I'm not, I don't want to see no cracks. Come on now. And the man says, no, don't, don't worry if you see some cracks. So sure enough, after living there about a year, I started to see some cracks. Saw some cracks in the floor. There was a big crack in the floor that just went all the way across one of the rooms. I was like, what in the world is that? <laughs> Saw little boards moving and, and kind of uneven, and some uneven things in the house. And I, I said, ooh, man, there's some cracks in this house. And I called the guy, and he was on call for the entire year. And he goes, I told you there was going to be some cracks. I go, why are there cracks? He says, the reason there's cracks is because the house is settling. It's settling. It's getting used to the environment. It, it, it's the, the wind and, and the movement of the ground and all the elements that are hitting that brand new house are, uh, are causing that house to become rooted. They're causing that house to take its position. And, and as it takes its position, there's going to be some cracks. There's going to be some flaws. There's going to be something. You know what those things are? Those things are called the character of the house. Come on, somebody. And, 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 and I want to talk to some of you that you've been examining this house. Or your children have been examining this house. And you go home and you talk to your teenagers and say, well, I don't like to go to church because I see cracks. Well, I don't like going to Victory Arch because I see flaws. Well, let me tell you something. You're not walking into a brand new house. You're walking into a house that has settled. You're walking into a house that has been tested. You're walking to a house that's seen some storms. You're, you're walking to a house. Come on, somebody that has fought some battles. Yeah, you might see a crack over here and you might see a crack over there. But let me tell you, you are walking to a house that knows how to weather the storm. We've gone from level to level to level. We're not brand new, baby. We're not brand new. We didn't just get here. Victor H. San Diego has been here for over 35 years. And guess what? We're stronger than we've ever been because we let the Lord take us through the wilderness. We let the Lord take us through the battle. We let the Lord take our marriages through the storm. Come on. Yeah, we might have lost a few people, but guess what? God didn't let us die in the wilderness. Yes, there's some cracks, but you are walking into a house that has been tested. Come on and give God a praise. We have been tested. We are still here. Touch your neighbor and say, thank God you are still here. I hope you're here next year. I hope you're here in five years. I hope you're here when the Lord comes back. You're in a good house. 
you're in a good house. You're in a church that knows what it's doing. You know, in a, you're in a church that knows where it's going. I, you're in a church that has a vision. You're in a, in, a, in a church with people that know how to pray, know how to press in, and know how to fight. We're not quitters in this place. We are people that know what it is to build God's house. Yeah, and there's some cracks and some crack pots. And sometimes I walk a little cracked. Thank God I'm not smoking crack. Amen. People don't even smoke crack anymore. Anyways. Yeah, I got some cracks. Yeah, I got a limp. Yeah, I walk with some scars. Yeah, I've been hit, but I'm still here. I'm still here. And, and you know what keeps a, a good house standing? Two things. Number one, foundation. Everybody say foundation. Paul, the master builder, he said, he says, no other foundation could be laid than that which has already been laid, which is Christ Jesus. And, and you're in a church... That's not built on popularity and on talent and on money and on worldly success. You're in a church that's built on Jesus. And he's tested it. It says, yep, I'm the foundation. But you know what else makes for a great house is not just the foundation. It's something called pillars. 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 And we are where we are today, not only because of the foundation, we're here because of pillars. Pillars that God has raised up. Pillars in the church. That's, that's something that God has been placed in my heart. You know, we've sent out so many people, we've even sent out pillars. And, 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 and every time we've sent out, we've seen God raise up other pillars, raise up pillars. And let me tell you something, we can't make it as a church without a foundation, without a covering, which is the pastor, and without pillars. What are pillars? Pillars are people that hold up the house. That when the storms blow and the trials come and the storms, and how many know they're going to come? Jesus promised it. Come on, he said, build your house on the rock because when the storm comes, he didn't say if, he said when, then your house will continue to stand after the storm blows. Woo, what a summer we have had. I was watching the news yesterday, it said it's the first day of fall. All right. All right. I said, thank you, Jesus. What a summer we have had. What a summer. The devil has done all. And you know what's crazy? Even in the midst of the storm and even in the midst of the battle, we are still building the kingdom of God. We are still, we raised $125,000. Come on, somebody. You can't do it without pillars that take their place in a house that's been settled. I thank God for you. Who? When storms rise, you get stronger. That when ministers get hit, you don't step back, you step up. That when someone gets sick, you don't start becoming a gossip. You step in and you begin to pray. I thank God for those of you that pray for me. Pray for my wife. I thank God for those of you that pray for our pastors that are doing spiritual battle on the Lord's behalf. We need you. We need more of you. We need, we need more pillars in this church. <laughs> are you hearing my heart this morning? We don't need visitors. We thank God for visitors. We get 30 every weekend. But we need pillars. We need pillars. See these pillars? When we remodel the sanctuary, we're going to take them off. Because there was a time we didn't have them. We don't need those on the wall now. We got them in the seats. Yeah. 
Come on, clap with me. Clap, catch this, catch this. See, what, what, what is your assignment? Maybe, maybe your assignment is to, get, to break the curses, but then maybe now your assignment is to help us build the house. Maybe your assignment, you had to break the curses and to get, there's people here that they've seen the faithfulness of God and you've done all you can, but maybe there's a new assignment. Maybe now God's called you to step up to build this house and help another family break through. Maybe, maybe God has called you to walk closer to me as your pastor. Maybe God has called you to walk closer to a pastor. You've been raising money, doing all these things. Wonderful, beautiful, but maybe there's a new assignment that God has given you. And say, you know what, this is the year before this year is over. I'm going to step up. I'm going to step closer to God. I'm going to step closer to his plan. I'm going to become a pillar, a stronger pillar in the house of the Lord. What about the young people? Can the young people be pillars? Or are the young people just an audience? with dreams. We need pillars. We need real, actual leaders. Real, actual leaders with character, with loyalty, with passion, with vision, with substance. Substance. Because we need it even more. And I'll tell you why, as I get ready to close. Matthew, you can come. Because we need to understand our vision is not to keep, but our vision is to send. Our vision is to send. It should never be that I have to call somebody off the mission field to be a pillar here. But it could get to that point. You know, Sam... Uh, I got to call you back. I know you're tearing it up in Africa. See, I'm giving you insight to my world. Some of you don't even know what I go through, what I'm thinking. You're thinking, I'm just going to church. You look great. What am I going to wear? <laughs> you don't even understand where I'm at. Man, Sam, you know, you did a great. I know you're tearing it up. Africa's having a revival. But San Diego needs you. And we have to bring you back because... Our pillars are crumbling. Our pillars, our young pillars are, you know, uh, get, you know getting distracted, and getting pulled out of God's will and pursuing things. That we have a whole generation. We need pillars in this section. This section. You want ministry? Well, I'm going to school, and I'm doing ministry, and I'm working, and I'm involved. Okay, great, but there's a heavier price than that. See, the world does that. The world goes to work. They work. They don't say they don't eat. The world has their volunteerism. I'm going here running for, you know, diabetes or whatever they're running for. And then they have, but... What makes us the church is that we're a chosen people to walk at a higher spiritual level. Some of you have been fooled. You think that ministry is just activity. And another thing to check off the list. Okay, I'm a leader. I went to UTC. I went to the... Okay, hold on. That's great. But what about your character? What about your exampleship? Are you willing to walk higher than the people you're trying to lead? Because that's the price of leadership, not just to do all these things and say, oh, well, I got money, I'm giving, I'm doing great, woo, awesome, I can lead. Okay, that qualifies you, but now do you want to be effective? Because if you want to be effective, this is old school, you have to walk higher than the people you want to lead. You can't walk lower than the people you want to lead and make exemptions. You, who could, you know, do, if anyone could excuse himself, it's me. But I determine in my heart that I want to lead you and I want to lead pastors and I want to lead ministry. And that's God's calling. That's I'm a leader. I'm not just called to get people saved. I'm called to lead. So I have to walk higher in character in order for them to desire to follow me. If I walk like them, I can't lead them. So we need pillars. 
Is this too hard? I'm burdened, man. I'm burdened. Because I think God's shifting our season not into a season of a season of speed. He's shifting us into a season of greater strength. And that's the fourth point succession as I close. Did you get something this morning? <laughs> Hey, I know you're saying, oh, you came too heavy, you know, too heavy. It's rough for hope. We're supposed to be having a party. That's the problem. Everybody wants to party all the time. And then a bill comes and everybody goes home and I got to pay the check. No, no, no. Succession. Someone say succession. There comes that season where we have to pass the mantle. I'm seeing some young adults in our church right now raising up saying, give me the mantle. Give me the mantle, I'm ready. And I believe their day's coming and they will get it. I just wanna make sure they're ready. I wanna make sure they can survive the storm. They can survive the battle, it's gonna come. But we need the gang to start understanding that one day the mantle will be passed to them. And if they don't grow the right way, they're gonna, this whole house will collapse. I want to be here forever, but I don't think we're going to be here forever, huh, Kanji? One day we're going to get our, we're going to have the real party. <laughs> the real reward is, oh, thank you, Lord. Great is that reward. Beam of judgment. Here's your crowns. Boom, 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 boom. But we'll have to hand it over. And I wonder if those people could handle what we're going to hand over. Imagine a building paid off. Worldwide ministry, global ministry. Who will do it? We think, Lou, I don't know. Scary stuff. You know. We got we gotta take this serious now. We gotta work with the youth. We gotta work with the young adults. We gotta start discipling them, not for speed, but for strength. For strength. Let them go through their trials. Let them go through their storms. Let them learn how to hear no. No. Can I go to Disneyland again? No. Unless your calling is to be Mickey Mouse. Crazy. Crazy. I want to be taken serious. I don't want to be calling Mickey Mouse pastor. Who is speaking into your life? I'm going to stay over here because you guys are looking at me mad. Scary. We're going to have to give this to you guys. But what are you going to do with it? See, Pastor, are you talking like an old man? I'm not young anymore. In five years, I'll be 50. That's not old, but I'll be 50. It's not 20. It's not even 30. I've been doing ministry a long time, 25 years. When I'm 50, I'll be have done it 35 years. Who does a job for 35 years? You got to be strong for that. I'd like to retire one day. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I ain't going to retire. I'll probably die. But at least say, hey. So we're chosen by God to walk with God that he might work on our life but then we're cho called to chose with chosen to walk with other chosen people other chosen people now I'm proud of the youth I, I think they've done phenomenal how many are proud of them they, 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 they've done good but you gotta go to another level man it's time to start saying you know what God I, I'm ready to take the mantle Walk a little higher. Some young adults, walk a little higher. 
So I'm going to take this man. I want you to stand with me. Ooh, I feel better. If you're new, let me tell you this. You walked into a heavy church. This is not, you know, we're not giving out cupcakes. Unless it's run for hope. Twenty dollar cupcakes. You walked into a heavy. You're gonna leave here and say, "Whoa, this is a heavy ministry." Well, understand what we're involved in. We're breaking generational curses in people's lives. They'll they'll never have to go back. They'll never have to go to prison. They'll never have to put a needle in their arm. They'll never suffer the way some of us suffer. How many think that's God's plan for victory outreach? You walked into a heavy church, my brother. You walked into a heavy church, my sister. But how many know this is what God has called us to do? And so I, I, we have a few minutes, and then we'll have a party next to us. But I, I want to get this off my chest to you in this service. And I want to give it to you. And I want to share my heart with you. I've been doing that these last few weeks because it's been a heavy summer. But I believe the, the season's going to shift. It's going to shift. But I need those of you that say, you know, I, I feel God speaking to me. I've been chosen to bear much fruit. I have an assignment. God is working in my life because he's going to take my family to a promised land. And that message was for me. Is that you?